reading from Deuteronomy. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And from Exodus, you shall worship no other god because the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. And from Psalms, those who put their trust in the Lord, who pay no attention to the proud or to those who follow lies, are truly happy. And from Matthew, you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. Amen. Beautifully done and an important message. Thank you all. Those who love to put up bird houses and bird feeders in their yards usually have no love lost for squirrels who are amazingly good at defeating the various impediments to bird feeders that homeowners try to put in their way. Squirrels are also known for eating their way into attics and doing a huge amount of damage. 
One of our first Christian folks once told me about a squirrel that had accidentally gotten into her home and proceeded to do thousands of dollars worth of damage. No wonder someone once said, squirrels are really just rats except with better PR. Speaking of PR, public relations, some of the food we eat has been made possible by clever public relations rebranding. You might, for example, turn up your nose at the thought of eating something called a Patagonian toothfish, but this bottom-dwelling species became a delicacy when through the miracle of good PR, it became Chilean sea bass. You likely wouldn't be tempted by a menu item called slime fish. But through clever PR, it has actually now become an endangered species after it was renamed Orange Ruffy. Researchers at Cornell University did an experiment with five elementary schools in which the vegetables on the school lunch menu were renamed. After broccoli was rebranded Tiny Tasty Treetops, <laughs> children bought it the following year at a 99% greater rate. Maybe if my elementary school had thought of that 50 years ago, I wouldn't be so confirmedly carnivorous. <laughs> These days, it sometimes seems that God, too, could use a good public relations firm. One study recently said that just 16% of non-Christians in their late teens and 20s had a positive impression of God. Digging deeper, that study asked what words they associated with the Christian conception of God, and 87% of them said judgmental. God's people, it would seem, might also need better public relations sometimes. Americans are leaving the Christian faith at a faster rate than ever before in our history, and that rate is accelerating. One in five Americans now claims no religious affiliation, and that number is one in three for 18 to 33-year-olds. And 70% of those 18 to 33-year-olds cite what they believe that the church teaches about God's attitude towards gay and lesbian folks as the reason for leaving the faith. I had a conversation with someone in our church last week who said, quote, it's just so hard for me to believe that people think of God as judgmental and concerned with things that seem irrelevant in the face of such injustice in the world. It's so hard for me to believe, she continued, because I have experienced the church as a community of people who truly want to be loving, and I have experienced God as a God of grace and comfort and justice. I wanted to applaud and say, bravo, bravo. But what you need to know this morning is that such an understanding is increasingly not the understanding of church and of God all around us. More and more of the folks outside these doors do believe that God is judgmental and bullying keeping score of personal peccadilloes and scowling in the face of tattoos and piercings, but not much concerned about justice and goodness in society. 
Once again, though, and as we have seen in other sermons in this series, you can understand why some folks might say these sorts of things based on some of what they find in the Bible. After all, it says it right there in Exodus. God is a jealous God. And yet, this is one of those references that should call us to return to what we have learned this summer about the nature of the Bible. As I have said before, the Bible is not simply a collection of verses all with equal weight. It's not just a kind of compilation like a computer code. No, it's a conversation in which is recorded both sides of things, some of which are more representative of the folks writing and some of which are more representative of that trend in the Bible towards a more and more loving and inclusive understanding of God. And so with just a bit of historical knowledge, we can read these li this line about God's being a jealous God as actually saying more about people at the time of the writing of this verse who were threatened and beleaguered by enemies than it does about God. And after all, jealousy is rooted in fear of loss, isn't it? And the Hebrew people during their long, scary journey through the desert after leaving Egypt were indeed profoundly fearful. Moreover, just as in our relationships, we sometimes project what most scares us about ourselves or sometimes what most angers us about ourselves onto the other person. And it's certainly not unknown, even in the Bible, for people to project those things onto God, too. Non-Christians also sometimes look at other things that can be found in the Bible and come to the conclusion that God is demanding, self-absorbed, self-centered, and wonder why we would worship such a being. You can certainly see how our two other scriptures this morning could give rise to that question. The very first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. And then Jesus is referencing that commandment when he says, you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Well, here's what I want to say about these two verses. Those who think that these somehow are pointing to a jealous, self-absorbed God are implicitly reading these verses as if they are threats. As if they are threats. They see God threatening them if they don't toe the line. But they are not threats at all. They're simply statements of fact about what it is like to be human. What do I mean? Well, let's look just at the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. We read it, we hear it, but we forget that it comes with an explanation. The words that come just before those words and now hear those words once again. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Therefore, the point, God is a God who seeks to free us from whatever is trapping us, whatever fear is hurting us. Taken as a whole, this verse, both parts, this verse is simply acknowledging the reality that if you and I don't worship a God who is about freedom and liberation, we will worship something else. We will give in to our fears. 
We will create idols that aren't about freedom at all and we will begin to insist that everyone else bow down to them. We will begin to prefer lies over truth. We will begin to prefer the slick over simple easy answers over accepting the fact that life is ambiguous and seldom amenable to quick fixes. If our God is not the God who brings people, all people, out of whatever Egypt is enslaving them, we will invariably begin to draw lines between people and demonize them and even dehumanize them. We will forget that throughout the Bible God has shown in verse after verse after verse God has shown a special love for the immigrant and the foreigner and has reminded again and again in verse after verse that the most important biblical virtue of a life lived under God's grace is that of hospitality. Writer John Pavlovitz puts it this way, quote, when folks forget that God is a God of freedom for all people, then fear becomes their false God. And when fear is your God, he says, you turn all of your attention to the things in other people that you're certain must really tick God off. And you make it then your sacred business to modify their behavior. Again, let me say, the first commandment, though, is not a threat. It's a statement of fact about your life and mine. The 17th century French mathematician Blaise Pascal said that every human being has what he called a God-shaped hole in it that is seeking always to be filled up. My friends, if that hole is not filled by, the de by devotion to a God who loves all people and wants all people to be free, then it will get filled by fear. And fear causes us to hurt ourselves and others, causes us to trample on our best values, causes us to presume the worst about others instead of the best, and causes us to see difference as a threat instead of a gift. That's why you shall have no other God before me. Our final scripture this morning is from the Psalms. Those 150 songs that for untold generations have been a source of comfort and challenge for generations of Jews and Christians, and on which I will be preaching a sermon series this fall. And this is a worthy place to begin to close this morning's sermon, for Psalm 40's words here cannot be read as any kind of threat and cannot give any ammunition to anyone who would claim that God is self-absorbed and demanding. For you see, Psalm 40 is actually a blessing, a benediction, really. Many of us may know it by its traditional translation, blessed is the one, but Peterson's translation can also ring fresh in our ears this morning. Those who put their trust in the Lord, who pay no attention to the proud, or those who follow lies, they are truly happy. I spent some time with this verse this week because you and I know that on the face of it, sometimes, sometimes being Christian doesn't make you happy at all. Sometimes it makes you feel downright different. Sometimes it makes you feel downright uncomfortable when your faith and your Bible ask you to love the unlovely and not to fear the unfamiliar. But there are two things I learned when studying this verse. First, 
In the original languages, the word here for happy or blessed is actually in the plural form. And that suggests something to me. That tells me that you and I need each other to keep ourselves strong and our faith resistant to those who would tell us lies and play to our fearfulness. We need each other to widen our empathies and push back against those lines that fear tries to scribble on our hearts. We need each other to strengthen our hope when violence scares us and justice systems fail us and when those who serve us are killed by cowards. We need each other. When grief overcomes us and we only want to lash out or turn inward, we need each other in the midst of a scary world to help protect one another and to help each other come closer to that perfect love that casts out fear, which Jesus calls us to, but which is just too much for any single one of us to embody and achieve all by ourselves. The second thing I learned about this verse is that that word blessed or happy also has its original language roots in a word that means going in the right direction. There are all kinds of directional signs all around us right now. Many of them are contradictory. Some counsel us to go in the direction of fearfulness. Some counsel us to go in the direction of suspiciousness. Some counsel us to go in the direction of cynicism in the face of a civic season where it sometimes seems that every choice before us is a bad choice. But the direction that God hopes that we will go was indeed stated so long ago in that first commandment. May we always find ourselves then following the footsteps of a God who is about liberation, a God who wants freedom from fearfulness, a God who was unfailingly present with a people who wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and who will be just as present with us as we strive to truly believe to truly act as if we believe what those angels of God so often said in so many ways, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I need that reminder of the way we should go. And I bet you do too. Do not be afraid. That's the way to go. Shall we?